Wolf Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. في إحساسنا أراه زاده التحنان في أبتغي حضن يتيم طاهر الروح نقي في إحساسنا أراه زاده التحنان في أبتغي حضن يتيم طاهر الروح نقيا كي يحيل ظلمة القلب بإحساسه ضيا كي أرى غابات أيامي بأضلاعه فيا كي يروي خافقي من طهر أعماقه ريا حضن أطفال اليتامى يترك الوجدان حيا يملأ القلب حنانا دافقا دفءا نديا بين أرواح اليتامى يسكن الحب نقيا قد حباهم ربنا نبضا بريئا نشعر الإحساس فيهم صافيا عذبا زكيا ضمني طفلي منيا ضمني أكثر هيا Download our app MP Radio from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store Follow and like us on Twitter, Facebook and Google+. You're listening to The Security Council, a zero ball, straight talking, current affairs program. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. You're listening to the Security Council, just like you heard in our jingle. And this is Middle Path Radio. Tonight, we have a slightly different show. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that very shortly. My name is Ahmed. And our text and call hotline number is 07477-080-248. That's 07477-080-248. Two, four, eight. I always get nervous when I start the shows, um, brother Ubaid, who is uh, our, the Mr. Producer. Sorry, is that okay for me if I call you that? Yeah, it works fine. So uh, I'm here with uh, Mr. Producer, and um, I've got a lineup today to discuss uh, several issues. Actually, I, after receiving a lot of criticism from the permanent members of the Security Council last week and, and the week before about how lengthy uh, uh, some of the uh, issues um, are getting or how, how much time we're giving to each of the issues I've decided to choose only one, two, three, four, five issues to talk about today actually I might make that six instead so I know it's not really working all the effort that the guys are are putting into um, uh, you know kind of what's the word I'm looking for impede my uh, control of, of this show despite occupying the Cafe Ikhwan and calling it the Security Council I've decided to talk about six issues. Five of them we've put out in a little uh, Telegram and social media uh, message. While well, read them to you, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, popularity of the United States in the world. Okay, how popular is the United States in the world? There's some very interesting statistics and research that's come out um, uh, just this week, 
and um, some of the facts, uh, some of the stats, sorry, excuse me, um, uh, I just found really, really uh, mind-boggling. Uh, you might be surprised to see some uh, some of those stats. So I'm going to read some of those out to you. As usual, I do have my articles at the ready, but today I'm not going to be as, uh, as as effective as as uh, I have been in the past. I was just going to say, um, do you want to give introduction to our guests that are in the studio? Yeah, I think the guest wants to give his own in- introduction today. Can we get the microphone out to, to Mr. Bush, our mascot, the pussycat? He's meowing, but it's not going on air, I'm afraid. He is actually meowing in the studio. Uh, he's not going on air. What we might do is put, post a little picture of Mr. Bush and put it on Twitter. So if you do you have Twitter, our um, uh, Twitter handle and account uh, name is at Middle Path Radio. So be sure to follow us on Twitter. Okay, that's at Middle Path Radio. I don't know if Mr. Producer is about to just uh, send out a tweet. The lighting in here ain't great, but um, yeah, he might actually put a tweet out. So be sure to follow our uh, account at Middle Path Radio. So where are the rest of the guests? Where are the so-called permanent members of the Security Council? Where is... Um, what were the names that I gave them? Robert the Beast Mugabe and uh, Jonathan Django. So was it good luck, Jonathan? Uh, where, where are these guys? Where's Desmond Two Guns? Where, <laughs> they're not here today. Mr. Producer, what, what's exactly happened? Um, I think Cafe Juan's back on again. I think the revolution and the resistance is strong and fighting back. Paid off. Uh, that's it. And, and you see persevering paid off. We got rid of the Security Council and Cafe Juan is making a strong cam- comeback. Uh, I believe uh, one of the contributing factors to the absence of two of the permanent, in inverted commas, permanent security uh, council members, one of the contributing factors to their absence today may well be the Ebola uh, crisis uh, uh, that broke out. In They may have caught that Ebola, I'm afraid. So um, uh, they're going to have to be quarantined. Uh, they're not here today. So I'm on my own with Mr. Producer. Who's just walked out of the of the studio because I think somebody's knocking on the door. Don't know what's going on, uh, to be sure. But anyway, we are reading the agendas for tonight. And what are these? What's going on here? What are you laughing at? <laughs> what are you doing here? You should be. You should be. You should be in. Uh, you know, in bed wearing one of those. Um. Uh, what, what do they call them? Radioactive suits. Those astronaut suits that they wear. You know, you, you you're suffering from Ebola. I heard you, you, you've caught the you've caught the virus. You've brought it back here after your visits in Africa. Flick that on if it's on. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, what are you doing here? Uh, so I thought I'd come because I can't be leaving you all on your own. Otherwise, this can't be the security We've already called it Cafe Ikhwan. We've already called it Cafe Ikhwan. What are you doing here? Uh, you sent me text message saying you were sick, right? <laughs> and I said you got the, you know, I, I said it on uh, air. At the moment I found out that you were all on your own, I thought I, so you, I can't. I think this must be uh, proof that there is a vaccination, uh, a working vaccination for, for uh, Ebola. Uh, as I can see, um, uh, what is it? Good luck, Django. Jonathan is here, <laughs> alive and well. <laughs> and we've got what, Desmond Two Guns here. <laughs> That's right. And Robert the Beast Mugabe is still down. Um, so um, we, we are waiting to get a live update on the, um, uh, on, on the development on uh, Robert the Beast Mugabe. So our thoughts go out to, to him. Um, uh, in all um, seriousness, though, um, Ebola is a serious crisis currently uh, raging Africa, uh, parts of Africa anyway, and uh, you know we wish uh, for, for a speedy recovery for all those suffering from from uh, from that virus. So coming back to our list, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to quickly read the agenda item that we were on. Right. So what we've got, I'm not very prepared today because I, I was thinking that we ain't going to go on air tonight. Uh, we'll just put a little apology message. But I realized this is my chance to, to get my, my show back in there. You know, those two permanent members are not, are not around today. And I'll just, you know, make it the, the Cafe Juan. And Mr. 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 Producer gave me the brilliant idea that go on air tonight. Okay. And um, you'll be, uh, you, you can have your show back, Ahmed. So, so this was my but chance. Unfortunately, but, obviously, but, uh, I can't let you do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, veto powers do re- reside with the permanent members. So... Unfortunately, your decision has been vetoed and uh, and overturned. <laughs> I see it as a, a small obstacle in our path to getting the show back. <laughs> exactly. You you may have uh, won this battle, but uh, you haven't yet won the war. The war, goes on. The war is right. over. <laughs> <laughs> so you think. We have already taken down one of your um, uh, military generals, um, uh, Robert the Beast Mugabe. He is not here today. So, Brother Zane, uh, if you're listening to today, brother, 
you know, give us a call, okay, or send us a text. No, you got to call us. You can't be texting us. You got to call us on this show and tell us what exactly has gone 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 on with you. Are you right now under quarantine, um, suffering from uh, Ebola? Um, and tell us about your. He could be your, under your, many different types of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, he could, <laughs> Mr. Producer. Here is the hotline uh, device. So if we're getting calls and texts, um, uh, the number is oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. That's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. Very quickly, um, uh, I just want to say, Baba uh, Khabab, um, uh, that we are talking about the popularity of the United States. Uh, you know, in the eyes of the rest of the world. Okay, there's some new research that's come out and some statistics talking about the popularity of the United States. Another thing we're going to be talking about is terrorism. Should you really be afraid? I Should you be afraid? We should have had a Twilight Zone kind of little jingle playing in the background. Terrorism. Be afraid. Talking be about very ju- afraid. Talking about jingles, uh, was our Security Council jingle played? I just had to make sure that you know there was no See, comeback of, like the mind of the Cafe Juan. He has actually still played... <laughs> <laughs> the uh the the jingle can we is it possible for us to hear that jingle one more time silence you see this is the influence of of cafe when the revolution is still strong hold on what's going on you're listening to the security council a zero bull straight talking current affairs program now that's what you call a jingle despite the fact that it is called um, um, it's called the Security Council I have to say that is one slick one very slick uh, jingle um, so to, to proceed we were talking about uh, you know we're going to talk about how whether you should be afraid about terrorism and I really like your thoughts on this guys you know is terrorism a serious threat is everybody living in fear and paranoia? Are you guys all in your um, underground bunkers right now, you know, quivering from the fear of terrorism, and uh, Im- imminent terrorism? It could strike? be your neighbor. It could be your neighbor. work colleague. Or it, it could, could be, be nothing. And it does remind me of a very, you know, although we don't, we'll go into a bit later, but it does remind me of good old the Cold War and the, uh, the common enemy, the, the commies, the communists. And yep. uh, you never know who could be a communist, your neighbor, your best friend, and... You know, that's right. Your family member, it could be even your the, own mother and father. The Red Army is, you know, already amassed its uh, its soldiers on the on the borders of the of the UK, and uh, you know, an, an invasion is imminent, as they had the people believe at that time. So, I mean, is terrorism a real threat? Are you guys really, um, you know, afraid? And uh, has it effect, Is it affecting your life? Is this? Uh, is if if it's a threat, you know, tell me how. Okay, call in. Uh, or send us text messages. It's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. It looks like Zayn did send a text, and I'm guessing it just says "lol." He's just saying it, he thinks it's funny. Well, at least he's still got his sense of humor despite suffering from uh, and being in quarantine. Uh, yeah, while being in quarantine. The other things we want to talk about, Baba Khabbab, is you know, excuse me, sorry. Why is he just sending us a text message with lol? He needs to be calling in. I know you're listening, yeah? So you need to make your make a phone call so we can hear how croaky your you voice need to, is. You need to unleash and the beast. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do need to do that, okay? So, um, you know, you need to apologize to uh, to all our listeners out there who... And I know you've got a really big fan base, you know. You're a bit like, um, uh, what's his name? Adam Saleh. You know, when you come to London <laughs> and Birmingham, you know, all sorts of things start happening. <laughs> you need a whole security entourage to... to you know, fend off all of these uh, fanboys and girls. And a crying video afterwards. Yep, and that uh, as well. He's probably crying right now, the uh, brother Zane. So if you, once you've, uh, you know, finished wiping your tears, please uh, give us a call so we can hear your voice on air. Right, so the US and Iran. The US and Iran, a secret love affair. So these are some of the things that um, uh, we're going to be talking about tonight. We might not get through all of them as you know, has been quite a uh, regular uh, happening on our <laughs> show. Uh, yeah. Then there's the other item, which is uh, Jewish and Muslim beheaders. What's the difference? Okay, um, spot the difference. Okay, Jewish and M- Muslim beheaders. And the last one is there's new report uh, that there's an effort, I believe, in the U.S. courts to have 2,000 um, images or pictures, photographs, basically, of serious torture uh, done you know, by the U.S. authorities or on the watch of the U.S. authorities. Okay, so this is being 
requested to be released, and this is being debated you know, right now in the United States, whether it's a good idea to release uh, those pictures or whether it is against the national security uh, of uh, of the United States of America. So those are some of the items we'll be we'll be covering. Do you want to add or throw anything in there, brother Khabbab? I know it's supposed to be the Security Council, but I still call the shots on on this show. No, no, uh, you're permitted to uh, draw up the uh, yeah, agenda have, of the discussion. You have given me consent. So you have you have delegated that role. Of to course, me. I understand. <laughs> yes. At the moment, I think we're, there's enough discussion within there, and I'm sure through the discussion, many other points will arise. Anyway, so. okay. I don't know how you <laughs> what you think about this, uh, brother Khabbab, but uh, there is this one thing that I did want to talk about today. Um, mm. uh, by the way, today I haven't followed the news much. Okay, so. What's current and trending right now? If I've missed anything, guys, Mr. Producer, I think you missed one in. very, very big thing. What's that? About oh. Apple launching its new watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I haven't actually checked any news on that. I'll be honest with you. Maybe Mr. Producer can uh, bring something up and we can give our own uh, first thoughts uh, on, on that. But I haven't actually checked anything. Hmm. I knew. I mean, I was anticipating I just saw a headline. Yesterday, I, That's I was just about it. <laughs> I was keen this morning, but I think after this morning, I just wasn't didn't have enough time to uh, to to just follow any of the um, you know RSS feeds on the release. Did they release the iPhone, the new one, the uh, sixth version? I think you've showed us the sixth version before. Those uh, were leaks. Um, yeah. They were very good leaks, but I mean, um, was that the one that did they release it? No, it was just the watch that I saw. It was just the watch. So they, yeah. they haven't released the phone. Nothing from. I just saw it very briefly. I just saw right, the so headline. We can talk about that. And we can talk maybe about we can a few maybe Apple <laughs> things. I know uh, Robert the Beast Mugabe is not here, a champion and fanboy. Uh, fan boy of uh, of the Apple uh, Apple um, uh, uh, school of thought, so um, uh, we'll we'll be maybe touching on that. But I also wanted to throw something a bit different in here um, today. Interesting. Okay, there's the pictures of the uh, the iWatch. I'm not very impressed, to be mm. honest with you. <laughs> this is already okay. Interesting. And that is not the official one. Where is the official one? Is that it? That just uh, mm, kind of looks naff to me. I'm sorry. I'm sure the Google looks better. Mm. Google hasn't got one. I mean, the Android oh, sorry. Uh, Google Sam- manufacturers. Sa- Sam- Samsung, isn't it? Samsung one does look nice, but the one that looks the best is the uh, the Moto 360. Oh, oh, bigger phones. So they have released phones as well? Yep, iPhones. Right, so I am like, you know, I'm supposed to know about this stuff and I just haven't had a chance today. I've been quite busy with a couple of meetings right before uh, tonight's show. Okay, but, Hold your hold your thoughts on on the iPhone. You know me. I want to come heavy on this one. All right. So hold your thoughts uh, hold your thoughts on the iPhone and the iWatch for a second. I might get you to read your article in this for a change on the Apple. So you might want to read something instead uh, of me doing some of the reading. But anyway, there was this thing. There was a little a video clip that was um, <coughs> uploaded to uh, to YouTube where Sheikh Hamza Yusuf um, mm. actually spoke about um, the concept of the of the Caliphate, Islamic Caliphate, and he gave a few of his ideas now guys i know you know there are a lot of people who agree with him and a lot of people a lot of people who disagree with him um personally on this occasion again i I find myself maybe disagreeing with him all right i reserve the right to do do so i also respect the fact that you may correct me you know and might criticize my view on this so you know if you do feel so that way then you know send us a drop us a text message okay like i said you know you can also do a whatsapp to the number 07477 Zero eight zero two four eight. That's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. Yes, I did find myself disagreeing with uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Some people will take issue to even calling him Sheikh, but you know, as a as a person who's a nobody like myself, I do want to just maintain uh, the basic uh, you know minimum of referring to him as as Sheikh uh, in this instance. Um, but if I do forget out of genuine mistake, then you know, please overlook that for me. Um, but he has said some strange things. I have to be honest; I've not heard these types of ideas before. That's um, so you know, call call us or text us and say that you don't know enough. You, you obviously do not know. That is the reason why you haven't heard these views. But um, you know, I, I I found some very strange ideas he's he's, uh, he's put forward. Um, uh, and, and why I want to talk about that? I want to talk about. That and I, in fact, I'm ready to talk. Start tonight's show with that topic. Have you watched the clip? I don't um, think you have. I, I, no, I haven't. I, I, I have followed uh, many comments that have come uh, from it, right. and uh, but so you're not in the best I, position I am to be. Um, I need to be educated. Some of your opinions on that today. If it was only five minutes long. We may have actually got the producer to um, play that clip uh, on air. Um, uh, I have the link. Is right. it five minutes long? I think it's five minutes long, I believe, yeah. 
Um, what I'll do is I'm going to quickly search for that. I do have it saved in Pocket, a very useful application available this on This is iOS the Security and Council, and not the say, Tech so Show. You put it on the Twitter page. Yeah, yeah, I will do. You want me to tweet that now? You tweet it now and then I'll, get, I'll play it as well. Uh, what I'm going to do, whoops, it's starting to play live on air. I don't want it to do that. Let me quickly um, text, uh, send that to you via tele- Telegram. There you go. It's already playing. I'm going to quieten that down a little bit. So I'm going to send that to you on Telegram, Mr. Producer. See if you can line that up for us. Okay. And maybe we can play certain selected parts where we scrub the uh, timeline a little bit back and forth to find the exact, you know, moments. Okay, so he he actually gets asked about the caliphate, and of course, you know, naturally today, for some reason, um, uh, everybody equating the concept of caliphate with this group called ISIS. So I just I don't want to get drawn into the discussion about ISIS because we've had that discussion uh, a few times, and really, I think this is just a red herring. It's a it's a distraction and a deliberate smokescreen regard and you don't have to do, deny the existence of ISIS or, or or even support them to say that it's still a smokescreen okay um it's been used as a way to kind of um uh, get away with things that they would not normally have been able to get away with without this kind of a red herring distraction okay in in, in the debate so i'll tell you what what he says i'm going to summarize and maybe you can find that um slot uh mr producer but what he does say is, um, I made a quick few summary. But I have paraphrased, so I will be fair in saying that I have paraphrased a lot of it. This is just my own take on this. And he's basically, number one, he's, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, he states that one needs his parents' permission to defend his family, his home, his religion, his country, his Muslim community. Now, he doesn't use those exact words, but effectively that is what he is saying. He actually says, you cannot perform any jihad or do uh, jihad without the permission of your parents. And he cites the hadith um, where one Sahabi wanted to go abroad and um, you know fight for his country, as it were, to be a hero uh, and a brother in arm. Uh, but uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he said to him that he asked him, do you have parents? And he replied, yes. And then he was told to then go and exert himself or do jihad in their way, in their service, so to speak. Again, those are just my own kind of added uh, translations there. Um, so this is this was uh, Shaham Yusuf's evidence to say that you need permission of your parents uh, to, to go abroad. I don't know how he extracted that. Uh, Brother Khabbab, um, but uh, what do you think of this particular uh, well, comment of his that you need, uh, you need permission of your parents to fight uh, to protect yourself, your property, your family? And your, I think and your, I've, uh, we've, we've heard this before um, as as uh, evidence in order to say that you should not go out and you should not, you know, like I said, defend your land and defend your honor and so forth. Yeah, that's uh, a universal kind of um, yeah. right of any country mm. or any citizen, right? And I think uh, many uh, different scholars have already kind of quashed that argument um, and, and mentioned in relation to the context of that hadith. That's and right. um, the context being that this was a, a situation where, uh, as was referred to, the kind of uh, fard al um, yeah. As it wasn't a scenario wasn't, where you were defending yeah, your it wasn't, country. It was more about... It wasn't a was fighting <laughs> an invasion, no, an invasion for an invasion It wasn't intended in, in defending. It was rather as um, kind of... A expanding, Expansionist. Expansion, yeah. That's right. right. So um, because of that situation. So here, obviously, many ulama have referred to the current day situation in certain places where it may be a concept of defending one's land. Yeah. Um, and that obviously... Like in the Spanish a, Civil War, for example, or, mm-hmm. you know, people who had to defend their, their lives and protect their, you know, the, say, for example, a lot of the revolutionaries in Libya uh, or in Bosnia, okay, or wherever they are, really, uh, in, in recent history, they were trying to protect their, 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 their history, their country, their homes, their religion. You know, these were people who were not, you know, the reason why I refer to some of those, um, you know, um, conflicts is because there was no bogeyman kind of scenario presented the way they are doing with ISIS right now. The moment you go into the Syrian scenario, the whole bogeyman, uh, you know, is thrown into the mix and it kind of kills the debate. Mm. You can't have a sensible and grown up conversation about that. So, but in Bosnia and Kosovo, and there were many, many armed groups at that time and same in even most recently in Libya there were armed groups and so on and so forth and they were defending the so in, in this hadith that was not the scenario the, the Muslims were not under attack from abroad rather this was a uh, a time where the Muslims were um, trying to expand their control on other 
uh, lands at that time outside of their borders and um, uh, you know to uh, to to spread free um, you know freedom to other countries that were where people were being oppressed so in that scenario you know, scholars have said that you you're not required to take permission for for your parents um, no you have you have you got it ready Yeah, yeah, let's hear that. You ha- jihad is prohibited without your parents' permission. It's prohibited. And, and if they go without, and you need to teach your children that. that and the Prophet, a, man came, a young man came to the Prophet asking permission to go on a military expedition. He said, are your parents alive? And he said, yes. He said, Fafihima fajahid. Do jihad taking care of your parents. Go build a hospital. Become a doctor. Heal people. Go serve the the, the orang asli. Hmm. Go go help the orang. The Christians are going and converting them, because nobody has nobody's going and serving them. Go serve them. Take care of them. They're nice people. Hmm. Hmm. Really, go protect the orangutan. Okay. So, <laughs> what is the orangutan? Is, is that, is that, that the monkey? Joke. Um, he, oh. he was talking about. He was actually talking about the uh, the orangutan was the last bit. There is another people orangutan. He was. T- so uh, referring to first of all, they have a maybe an ethnic group in in Indonesia or Malaysia. I'm not sure. Maybe they are um, kind of uh, you know diffi- a group that are, have got some sort of uh, experience, some sort of difficulty. Um, so I mean, but the orangutan, the last bit was was a joke, and he, everybody laughed at that. Uh, it was a genuine, uh, light-hearted joke. Um, so that's that's the excerpt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Producer, for finding that uh, short clip. Perhaps you can find a couple of the um, other sections where. Uh, it's actually quite hard. It isn't five minutes long, is it? It's quite a bit longer than that. I think it's about twenty odd minutes. Oh, sorry. Uh, to me, well, it sounded like uh, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I listened is to that it. how much how, how into it you was. I, I'm so entertained. How uh, time I, flies. I love listening to lectures, and it, time did fly. And I've listened to it twice, by the way. So those of you thinking, oh, you just listened to five minutes. So was that was that I listened to was the that whole twice, thing twice in five minutes, or was it? Uh, maybe it was <laughs> in my um, time span. It was maybe a total of ten minutes. Now, how about we put the clip up on the Facebook and the Twitter? And the listeners, yeah, let them send in their comments on on, on yeah, Twitter sure. or, or on Facebook as well. But even better, Mister uh, Producer, would be for them to call us now and uh, call the number that's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. That's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. You know, I know there's a lot of people who really respect um, Hamza Yusuf and. You know, a lot of people who disagree with him and have take issue with some of the things that he says. You know, if you do feel strongly about this, you know, be, f- you know, feel free to comment. You know, we're not going to, you know, hound you on air or anything like that. You know, we're going to say, okay, that's your opinion. You know, uh, we may agree or disagree uh, that you have the right to, you know, criticize uh, something or give us a different perspective. You don't have to be hostile. You can say, brothers, I think you may be getting the wrong, you know, angle here, end of the stick here, guys. There is something else that you didn't see. Okay. Obviously, that's the first time I've listened to that clip. I think it's very, very much clear that um, I'm not making you know, stuff up. The, 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 the hadith, <laughs> that much is clear. That specific hadith, many ulama have already dealt with that issue, and you know, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. As in, like the same, you know, hadith referring to how, uh, or, well, the so-called hadith that they've returned back from the greater jihad to, I'm sorry, the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, jihad on nafs. Uh, you know, right. which actually wasn't a hadith anyway. Yeah, it um, was a fabricated, made-up um, narration. Uh, and, and that particular narration uh, said that, as you already described, that the Muslims had come from the battlefield and then entered the um, relative peace of, of you know urban life and the, the, the marketplace. And the Prophet had apparently, allegedly said, that we left the, the smaller jihad and now we entered the greater jihad which is the ordinary day-to-day uh, life in, in you know going to market and stuff like that and uh, you know it made sense to some people because you know there's the whole you know challenge of lowering your gaze and um you know there's a whole challenge of you know not cheating people when you are you know doing business in marketplaces and stuff like that there's a whole challenge of you know just um, not losing your temper and all the things that islam teaches you to do not to be well, proud they and all kind of fall on the wider concept of obviously yeah, jihad. but that but particular that particular narration is not true and the prophet did not say uh, in fact that it, was, it was the greater from, jihad from what i understand this was actually a saying of a predecessor um, on his return, something that he thought as his observation. Allah um, Allah, I don't, later I don't on, know. Maybe you are correct. Which was then later on taken through many changes and eventually it was kind of misconstrued and believed to be a hadith. You're probably right. I mean, I, haven't, I, I didn't know that. Um, so, but 
what is known is that Imam al Nawi, according to his Ijma'i, he said that this particular hadith is um, fabricated, it's mawdu'ah. So, um, another idea, by the way, I want to quickly move, because we've got so many other agendas. Um, another idea that um, he, uh, the Sheikh promoted was that there is a difference of opinion regarding having two caliphates. All right? uh, it is okay to have more than one Amir, right? one Amir al Mu'mineen, one uh, Caliph, one Khalifa. Uh, uh, to say in the Arabic so word. just to understand why did he raise that issue up is he trying to he was, say that ISIS is a legitimate khalif this is, and therefore I mean, he was actually one? asked a direct question about you know the project to establish um, the uh, caliphate or the Islamic uh, the Islamic state I'm not talking about the group or the organization the, the rebel group Islamic Dawla or ISIS ISIL Daesh whatever you want to call them right I'm not talking about that group but the entire Islamic concept Islamic uh, the unity of the Muslims under one ruler. He was asked about that, and then it was also asked with regards to, re- in reference to ISIS uh, in Syria and the entire project. Because ISIS is not the only group that is trying to establish, you know, a unity of the Muslim uh, under one single government. Okay, because there are other rebel groups trying to do that, and it's not only happening in Syria. It's not happening only in Iraq. There are many other regions of the world where Muslims. Are trying, you know, uh, involved in this project to establish a unity of the Muslims. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is not illegal. This is something the state building. Muslims want to. You know, the Jews have done that. They've they've gone to Israel forcibly and illegally, taken the land and made them made themselves a homeland. Um, Muslims have been looking for this kind of political, um, economic unity and really a unity of faith first and foremost before anything else. So he suggested the idea that. There's difference of opinion regarding whether there can be, um, whether there has to be only one caliphate. So I found that really strange, because it kind of defeats the whole purpose on a logical level. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a Islamic uh, unity, Islamic state, okay, Islamic government, right? Um, or a khilafa. It's better to use the word khilafa because the Islamic state could mean a country that is Islamic, i.e., a state that is Islamic. But that is not what Khilafa is. Khilafa, it could be more than several countries where Muslims, you know, um, reside and are united there offer, under one authority, okay, one one ruler, and they implement the Islamic, um, you know, um, the God's word, basically, in, the, in their countries, all of the countries. So I don't want to use the word Islamic State for two reasons, because people can assume that it means the group, ISIS, or it can also mean it's just a country that is very Islamic. And some people think Saudi Arabia is a very is a state that is quite Islamic. But that is not Khilafa. That is not an Islamic state. So I want to avoid using that word. We want to use the word Khilafa to refer to the caliphate. Shall we play that clip? Yes, sir. Uh, in in a text that was taught, the imama is in aqidah traditionally. That's where they deal with it. If you read the books of aqidah, they usually deal with imama. It's one of the furu' of aqidah. Um, and Imam al has has extensive bahath on it. Um, Imam Tiramsani, uh, Ibn uh, Zakri, great scholar from Fez, has a very nice um, bahath uh, research on that. Uh, Ibrahim al-Laqani, the great uh, Maliki scholar from Al-Azhar, whose text was taught for si- last 400 and some odd years in, uh, in the Middle East, in sure. Al-Azhar in particular, he says, وَوَاجِبُ نَصْبُ إِمَامَ الْعَدْرِ بِالشَّرْعِ فَعَلَمْ لَا بِحُكْمَ الْعَقْلِ وَلَيْسَ رُكْنًا يُعْتَقَدْ فِي الدِّينِ فَلَا تُزِيغْ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ الْمُبِينِ He says that, to have a, an imam, meaning a ruler, that's traditionally what the, the ruler was called. He was called imam, because he's the leader. He said, and, ha- and it's an obligation to have an imam. And, and then he says, by the sharia, not by the aql. In other words, it's, a, it's a, a divine injunction and not a rational principle. Because the Mu'tazidite disagreed, they, they said it wasn't from sharia, it was a hukum aqli. So he said it's not a, a rational judgment, it's actually from the sharia. But he said, but it is not a rukun of the religion. It's not a pillar of the religion. So, so as long as we're on air, so just pause quickly there, we're going to resume again from, from where he stopped. Um, 
you've noticed that he's quoted several scholars from different backgrounds, different parts of the world who have done, you know, in, you know, deep research on, on this subject of having an imam, the Amir al-Mu'min, one leader, uh, the leader of the, of the caliphate, the Khilafah. And he said very clearly that all of them have agreed. And these are scholars that he agrees with. These are not scholars that he's come from, you know, a Salafist school of thought or an ISIS sympathizing, you know, scholar. These are classical scholars from before. And these are scholars that he respects. Okay, and what did they say? He said that having the imam is actually a shari'i requirement or a divine injunction. It is not something that is simply a logical uh, progression of a community when it become, grows and it becomes like a country, and you know, as the Mu'tazila have uh, presented. So he has made that view. And then he went on to say that it is not a, a pillar of, uh, of Islam, but that is already known, that we have five pillars of Islam, but it's not a pillar of Islam. He may have been referring to Aqidah, yet he does say in the beginning, before he uh, went into the quoting of the different scholars, his view on ima- having one imam, or having the imam for the, for the caliphate, he did say that it is a part of Aqidah, one of the furu, one of the branches, I believe, of, of Aqidah. So it is still um, part, of the, part of Aqidah to, to have a caliphate. So at least he has at, uh, confirmed and acknowledged that having a caliphate or a caliph is actually part of the Islamic belief. You know, and it's, it's something that Muslims, um, a lot of Muslims actually don't know. Let's quickly resume with the clip. Don't go against the Imam who you have, whoever's your ruler. Because the Prophet in his bay'ah, he said, don't, don't go against the people put over you. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and obey those put over you. Now, can there be more than one Imam at any one time? That was an ikhtilaf issue. And the ulama differed. And they said uh, that there could be if the lands were far apart. Uh, the, 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 the khilafah never ended in Morocco. There, there's been an unbroken chain for the last over 400 years. Um, and the king has always been known there as Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's a Qurayshi Hashemite. So you heard it there. That was my next point that I had observed that um, of course he said you know don't go against your rulers and stuff like that but he does clarify this point um, by saying that you cannot obey anyone not your parents not no ruler if they are if it involves any disobedience to Allah the creator you are not allowed to obey creation over this by disobeying the creator all right this is a well-known rule in Islamic uh, knowledge and law so but he then gone on to say something quite strange which is that um, he said there's ikhtilaf, there's difference of opinion whether you, you, know, you, know, you need only one, one imam or there can be many, more than one caliphate, okay? One, uh, more than a couple of Islamic so that, That's strange to me. Why? Because we understand that, you know, logically speaking, that it doesn't make sense to have more than one caliphate. It kind of defeats the purpose. But also there is some Islamic textual evidence um, suggesting that it's not possible for there to be more than one imam. Okay, and it, there, I don't see any precedence of this in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where Abu Bakr Siddiq was the Imam and then there was Umar ibn Khattab who was also an Imam just because he was far away in a different land and so on and so forth. By, by all means, they had governors ruling different parts of the Islamic empire okay, and the Islamic unity um, that, that, that they had, but those were still governors under the leadership and authority of one Imam. Okay, perhaps in... History after that, there was disunity in the Muslim uh, Ummah and there were more than one Imam. I don't know if that itself, just the fact that it did happen, is, is itself a, an evidence to state that it is correct or al- allowed to have an Imam. Perhaps he could expand more on that. He didn't have much time to say all of those things. Just one, one more thing. Um, he then said the strange thing, which was that there is still a caliphate that is around alive and well today since the time of the well i think he said he's, there's a chain of they've got an authentic chain all the way to the time of prophet Salaam, if i'm understanding that correctly right and that is in morocco the, the royal family of morocco and the king of morocco is actually the amir al-mu'minin <laughs> so I, I was quite surprised and i'm taking everything else with like okay this could be something that i don't know i haven't learned yet okay i, I know it's not could be i most certainly i haven't learned a, a lot of things but when he said that the the king of morocco is one of the amir al-mu'minins i mean that whole itself is like an ox, ox, oxymoron amir al-mu'minin only means one by its uh, definition so when he said that, I was quite taken aback, and I started to think, "Now this is something strange." All right. So I said that he went on to promote the Moroccan royal family as the current Khilafah. Uh, I just found that 
very strange. Well, I mean, what do you think? Are you, have you given your baya, uh, brother Khabbab, to the Moroccan king? I've been to Morocco, by the way. I would have loved to meet the uh, the caliph. I've never been to the country, nor do I intend to at this moment in time give baya to Mr. Producer. I understand that you are the official ambassador of uh, of the caliph, uh, the Moroccan king, here in in London. Is that correct? That's somewhat true. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the royal uh, emissary from uh, his his highness. Um, I think we should all get a visa tourist and just check out the beaches over there for. for <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, Is it all about the beaches and the resorts? Yeah, we can consider giving our bayah to the Moroccan king, the Amir al-Mu'minin over there. All right. So he he cites he goes on. I'm, I can't go on giving you guys more play uh, play because we haven't got time to listen to everything. But you know the video is there, guys, and uh, we will be um, putting it up on on our Twitter uh, account as well as perhaps on our Facebook. So go check it out to hear the whole f- whole thing. See if we're being a little bit unfair or not. You can you can judge for yourself. So it's on the Facebook already. I've just put it up. Oh, thank more. you, Mr. Producer. See, he's multitasking. That's why he just lets me do the talking. And uh, mashallah, he's you know the, the the show is run really. By the producer, so another thing, brother Khabbab, is that the the uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf he goes on to then uh, he cites a, an unrelated hadith that he quotes from Bukhari as an evidence for not establishing the Khilafah. Again, he cites one of those hadiths uh, to uh, to say that it is not required for you to um, create this uh, caliphate or appoint an imam. So I find that really strange. Do you know what what hadith this is at all? You haven't heard this this lecture mm, yet? No, I don't. Okay, well, it's a hadith that I think a lot of you brothers and sisters will already know about, have heard before. Um, if I'm misquoting, then please forgive me. I'm going to quickly um, abbreviate it uh, for, for uh, you know for the for the sake of our audience who are listening. Basically, the hadith is of of the Sahabi who normally asks the Prophet sallam about the evil things or the or the wrong things in in the world, so that he can asks about those things so that he can safeguard himself from those he can identify them and he can stay away and abstain him and protect himself from those evil things okay unlike the rest of the sahabas who would always ask about you know the good things and the, and the nice things and, and stuff like that so um on one occasion prophet uh, gave a warning uh, to him saying that uh, there will come uh, you know a time where you know there will be a lot of people calling uh, you to um, you know some some sort of Islamic message, but um, they will actually um, be calling you to hellfire with that message, right? And so do not follow them. And and the Sahabi he asks Prophet why uh, when will uh, you know uh, when will this be? Why will that be? Will, will that be? The, what should I do when that happens? Okay, when what, what what would you advise me to do? And the Prophet says, then you must stick with the Jama'ah and you must stick with the Imam. All right, this is in reference to what we're talking about, the Imam, the Amir al-Mu'minin. Okay, and the Jama'ah is the main body under that Imam, the supporters and the main community of the Muslims, right? Okay, and in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explains who he refers to when he says Jama'ah. He, Prophet ﷺ explains that the Jama'ah is what Prophet ﷺ is upon and what his companions are upon. So any people who are following the exact model of Prophet ﷺ and his companions, then they are known as Al-Jama'ah. Okay, there are different general looser interpretations. It just simply means the entire, the majority of the Muslim community as well. That's more linguistic um, reference d- a definition there as well okay so he was advised to stick to the imam and stick close with the the, the rest of the community the jama'ah okay those people who follow uh, quran and sunnah right and and the model of their companions then the sahabi he asked what if the muslims don't have a jama'ah or an imam to unite them under and uh, that was when the prophet sallam apparently replied by saying then you should avoid all the sects okay you should avoid all those um, sects okay altogether so this is, this is when um, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf then goes on to say, see, therefore, Prophet did not say, go establish a state, go establish the unity, go and uh, create this uh, imam, go and appoint an imam. Um, if it was an obligation, he would have told him to go and, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, appoint an imam. So I find that very strange that this is, you know, what was not mentioned in a hadith, I don't know if that can be used as an evidence, what was not mentioned in a hadith. If it categorically said, do not establish a state 
um, uh, you know, or do not busy yourself with trying to unite the believers. Go and stay in isolation. If that was the message that Prophet Muhammad said categorically in, but in his own words in the hadith, then Sheikh Hamza Yusuf does have a very strong evidence here to say that you shouldn't, you know, in times like this, you shouldn't establish the state. But I think what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is saying is that you know, there's no obligation for you to do so. And I think that evidence is very weak in, in the sense, in, in pr- making that argument. The hadith itself is not weak, by the way. I meant the argument is weak by using this hadith. So, I don't know. I mean, wh- what do you think? Is He says that this is it's not necessary for you to do so. He does admit it's a it's a, a part of aqidah. He does admit it's a divine injunction. Yet he says you're not required to... Uh, you know, establish the unity and of, of the Muslims and establish the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just think all of this sounds like kind of political talk really here. Like just politicians do, you go around and around in circles trying to kind of evade the question without answering it, putting your foot in it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like he's saying, yes, it's right. No, it's wrong. Yes, it's, it's yeah, all just that, confusion. It's contradictory. It's on one just, hand, it's, you're saying it's, it's part of the aqidah, the Islamic belief. If you say it's part of aqidah, then I think that's very much clear cut. It's, it's you can't then turn to and say no. It's a injunction or divine injunction. And then you're saying, you know, you don't have to do it actually. So it, it makes sense. Does that mean that we don't have to follow the, <laughs> the aqidah? Or we don't need to unite the Muslims. We're better to avoid all the, all, all the sects. So, well, I think all of this is just confusion. I think and, I would like or, to know more about the context of that. I think there's, there's one thing. The one thing the that there are no, many, many speakers and scholars and lecturers who today are just saying the most confusing of things mm. where on simple topics which have been very much clear topics over many years such confusion is coming about um, because I feel what they're trying to do is trying to please everybody and mm-hmm. unfortunately in this world you can't please everybody you know uh, you either speak the haq which will n- inevitably mean that you will uh, you know uh, anger or not gain the pleasure of those who are opposed and those who are enemies of Islam but that that's what comes with haq you know when speaking the haq this is exactly what's going to happen so it seems very strange that you try to please everybody and and keep everybody happy and kushti and because by doing all of this it just creates confusion and then it leaves the muslims being confused thinking okay so what is the right thing to do totally agree with you there um it, you know i think some of uh, the i'm not referring specifically or directly only to uh, sheikh hamza yusuf but a lot of the muslim speakers out there need to speak with more clarity and with more assertiveness there seems to be this kind of uh, they've kind of expert uh, what's the word perfected this art of um saying a lot of words but then not saying anything he was asked categorically about the uh, effort to establish uh, a, a, a unity of the muslims or, the, or on the law of islam um in syria and iraq and in the muslim world in general and even they, they asked about ISIS and he, he doesn't actually answer the question. Perhaps it is a good thing that he didn't answer the question directly because it may have opened a can of worms. So I do want to give acknowledge that and, and uh, give him credit uh, for that. But I, I just found some of the other ideas quite strange that, you know, you can have more than one caliph and that you can have, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That, the, you know, the current caliph that exists today is, is the king of Morocco. You know, it's so strange. There's one in Nigeria and there's another one uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, according to many uh, followers of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And so it's like it's, it's happening. Probably one in Egypt as well, then, yeah? One, there's probably one in Egypt as well, of course. Um, so all sorts of strange things are happening. I want to finish on an uh, interesting note. Ironically, um, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf then um, actually near to the end of his lecture, I do want to play, and he's quite scathing. But I, I, is it possible to get that up at all? I've, I know you've probably closed the link, uh, Mr. Producer. What part is it again? It's near to the end. I'll tell you what happens, and uh, while you look for it, it's near to the end. And what what uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf does is he talks about the Happy Muslim uh, video, okay, <laughs> and uh, and he basically. He's very scathing in his criticism about the actual soundtrack, and um, he was criticizing the soundtrack. He criticizes yeah. in what he refers to actually a very s- tragic incident where a sister uh, was uh, watching the video on her phone, and she was then texting her friend saying how happy she is by watching this video. Okay, and then she got hit. I think she was driving and texting, or, sh- or somebody hit her in a car in a road traffic accident. She died, and then the uh. sheikh uh, goes to say something quite. Um, he wasn't a sister. I actually recall this. This was a individual who was listening to the song. Yep. And then what she tried to do was, you know, the whole selfie craze. So she started taking a selfie of herself uh-huh. and and going about to tweet it or whatever it was or Instagram it or Facebook it to write, I'm so happy, uh-huh. listening to the happy song. Okay. And while she was doing that, driving at the same time, she was then hit and then she died. That's right. Yeah, that's basically and what her happened. last tweet was that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so, so happy, happy after watching this video. <laughs> now, you guys, it wasn't necessarily related right to the happy video of the Muslims, but it's just the 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 song yeah, itself, that's why, the that's music what, video. That's right. That's why I didn't want to. I think that's why I tried to make it clear that it was. I think criticism of the soundtrack itself, mm. not the video of the. Uh, the well, it was what, actually the adaptation, the, yeah, yeah. or what do you call it, the cover, the, the, or the Muslim parody of your yeah, or, or, of that, yeah, <laughs> of the original soundtrack. So he was very scathing, and I quite found it quite surprising that people um, that he he had said that. And I think a lot of people, you know, we take good and we leave what we find not to be um, agreeable uh, so in, in this regard he's actually criticised um, uh, you know this craze of selfie taking and um, you know how we're so engrossed with our you know cell phone smartphone mobile phone we're, we're so, so did he give a fatwa against taking selfies <laughs> no he didn't Ooh. go that far but he, he I was quite surprised he's very he was very um passionately scathing about about that and even regarding the lady that died he said you know she's not very happy right now is she and i was just like whoa, whoa. i was taken back by some of the, <laughs> these comments you know i don't know i, I don't want to comment i don't want to add more i think our producer is about to find the exact uh, moment uh, of the clip but if he does we'll move on uh, along the way and when he does he'll he'll, he'll allow entertain us with with that particular um, clip from so, so, just, just to make sure it's not the clip from the happy song so no no we're not going to play the uh, happy Muslims <laughs> video um, are, are, we, are we good? yeah uh, it's probably about 30 seconds before the actual actual line that you're talking about but we can play from where, from where it yeah, is yeah if you think that's a good part for yeah. us to start playing from go for it So, just a minor couple of glitches there, technicality. Um, while we set that up for you, I think we haven't got the exact correct position um, set up. Once we do, we'll be able to have that going live any second now. In the Emirates, they've had several mortal fa fatalities, accident, car accidents from people taking selfies. They kill themselves driving. We had it in America, people taking selfies. One girl was listening to the happy song you know this stupid song about happy like a house without a roof? I mean, who the hell is going to be happy if they have a house without a roof? And, and so they're listening to this song, and she tweets to her friend, Oh, I'm so happy listening to the happy song. And she goes into the other lane and has a head-on collision. That was the last thing she tweeted. Hmm. Happy listening to the happy song. Now where is she? Not so happy. <laughs> you know, seriously. I mean, all these... Cameras, I'm so sick of cameras. <laughs> I, really, I've ne I don't, my wife's here and she knows. I don't take pictures. This is my camera. I can see all of you. If I close my eyes, I see my teachers. Mm. Well, I, I see them in my heart. I don't need a camera. I never take pictures. People say, can I? But the Habab, not, not so happy now. I don't know why you're so happy. You ain't been listening to the track, have you, but the Habab? I know you're always in, in, involved. I, I, I know you're always, uh, you know, taking selfies. You know. Well, you know, uh, I, I do learn from the best, from Brother Ahmed, of course. You know. I, I, I understand that you've been buying this new Sony phone. It's actually called a selfie phone. It's got like a 13 megapixel front-facing camera. Mashallah, I never knew that. You never knew that? No, no. Wow. Well, you see, the, uh, quite the humble brother now. <laughs> was that the main key selling point of that phone? Yeah, that was the main <laughs> It was a selfie phone, yeah? It's a selfie yeah. phone, yeah. MashaAllah. So um, this is becoming like a selling point. So it's quite interesting to see Shaykh Hamza Yusuf uh, talking about that. And I think, yeah, but, it's uh, going to be crazy. But at that point, I think uh, he's got a very, very valid point there. Although I, mean, I have disagree with all of the other points he's mentioned in that video. That's right. Uh, uh, I think that point is is true. The, the kind of self-indulging craze that we have today of people... Um, Self promotion, yeah, self promotion, self self and it's just, it's just all, all of this is just emptiness. Just trying you know, to make a celebrity true. out of uh, the yourself, individual, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so anyway, we were talking about a number of things. I haven't even started on the things, but we might not get through everything tonight. I'll give you guys already a, a clean heads up. And tonight was supposed to be a shorter session than our regular uh, two-hour session because we don't. It was going to be the you know the very quiet and simple and dreary yeah. cafe Juan, but you know but we had to kind of lower <laughs> it up again, bring back the security. I like how you I like how you brought that one in, in, in Mister <laughs> you know Desmond Two Guns. I can easily just put his level levels down and over here. I think that's exactly what you need to do, Mister. <laughs> Power is a conspiracy with the producer for the producer is supposed to be the neutral you, you won't pay him enough you're meant to be a peacekeeper you know <laughs> who are you you're peacekeepers anyways so I mean we were talking about um, 
the US popularity in the world. And there's a lot of stuff that we could choose. I've got to now pick and choose now. Terrorism, should you be afraid? Should we read that one or the US and the Iran? I think well, I like the whole the, 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 the terrorism just, just being afraid. The, uh, of our <laughs> So the topics we wanted to cover today was the uh, US popularity in the world, some very strong statistics coming out from a report recently. Uh, another one is terrorism, should you be afraid? Uh, number three is the US and Iran, a secret love affair. And number four is Jewish... That sounds good. That sounds good. That sound, I knew that one would sound good. Um, another one is Jewish and Muslim beheaders. Um, and another one is the, you know... Torture images that may be released by ah, US so officials. Let's start with the, uh, the love affair, you know. Affair, yeah. Then we go on to it reminds you of uh, Bill Clinton. And, I don't uh, know why that's called that um, because I cannot even uh, remember what that was about. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, so because I, as I told you, I am not prepared. But maybe I can give you guys a cue while I find the necessary um, sources and references for the secret love affair between the US and, and Iran, maybe you guys can comment about the uh, beheadings that have been uh, recently <coughs> happening. Um, you know, I'm talking about the uh, uh, Jewish um, uh, or Israeli guy who was um, uh, beheading. Did you guys read the article? At all, I have was, it here. Was he found to be a Jewish guy? Yes, he was is that indeed. Hundred like percent confirmed. Um, uh, it's, yes, it is. Zionist fanatic who beheaded the maid wanted to join Israel, uh, fight against Hamas. All right, so that's one of the articles there. Uh, it's what country was he from? I did. I do remember. Recall, I do recall the headline. I just some newspaper report that a Muslim beheaded. Someone. That's right. That's why. Uh, that's why they, this one's called the uh, Muslim and Jewish um, beheaders. And if we're going to refer, that's exactly the reason why I've referred to him as, as Jewish because of his faith that he follows. I don't think he has. Uh, you know, well, in the case of the Muslim guy who did it, uh, well, so-called Muslim because it's not you know, confirmed he was a Muslim. Yeah. I, well, there are reports say, suggesting that he was a revert Muslim. Okay, but I don't think he was motivated by his faith to um, go and uh, decapitate somebody. He did seem quite mentally disturbed. God it really was, knows. It was reported that basically he was going around and uh, he beheaded a cat. That's right. Um, and he was screaming about the cat um, bit him or ate his food or something along that. Like, I can't record it I specifically. The, I thought you were going to say that the cat barked at him. Yeah, it's just like basically he won't even think, and then he, they, they found a decapitated cat, and then afterwards this old lady who was decapitated. So it does very much fit in line with the fact that it does seem like he was mentally disturbed or deranged. Um, yes. And so you know, not necessarily in full control of his own actions. No, I totally uh, agree with you, uh, with you there, and that's the reason why we've we've selected to talk about that because the Sun uh, newspaper tried to run a. Uh, did they actually? All, they probably did run. They ran. It. They ran the story yes. on the front page. Saying that the uh, Muslim guy convert beheads, beheads a woman, eighty something year old woman, you know, as uh, you know, that's just you know, so cheap, it's such a low shot. I just find that you know, but low that blow. That low shot. Can you imagine how many uh, Muslim sisters and brothers got like the raw end of it, being spat out, being sworn at because of, because of that one headline news, and now it's proven that it's not who they're claiming to be. And on, on top of that, the fact that. All other mainstream papers and news outlets did not report the word Muslim within that article at all, they anywhere. Shows, and in fact, the restraint. police even uh, uh, they had statements of the police saying they don't believe this action was a uh, terrorist motivated. Is that That's the right. correct terminology to use? Uh, you know, uh, so therefore this was the only one that kind of stood out. And I think a lot of people did kind of realize. I'm angry with me. This seems very strange because there are some people out there who do read some other newspapers. But mm -hmm. then you've got obviously just the Sun fanboys and girls and the ones that only take the news, you know, um, as facts from the Sun. And obviously they're the ones that will take this, <laughs> your kind of EDO and Britain's first kind of, you know, avid readers, yeah. you know. So, so it, it's not fair to just um, do something like that. It's, it's you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just plainly um, racist. It's a breach of their code. It's a breach of their uh, the guidelines. journalism codes. Yeah. They mentioned that uh, in order to mention religion within the article or the religion of a culprit or so forth, um, it's only kind of, it can be mentioned if it's related to the the news or the story. And here is very much completely unrelated. Yeah. His faith has... Effectively, nothing to do with somebody who is in a mentally unstable. Just like the story that they were trying to, um, that they still are um, banding about everywhere, the the rape of young girls in Rotherham. 
mm. just like the rape of many girls across the UK and even outside of the UK in the whole of uh, the you know uh, in different parts of the world. On that um, point, I actually have a very interesting. The religion fact. had nothing to do with it. You see? An interesting fact. It says Please here, share your facts. We love your yeah, facts. Uh, here yeah, mentioned. Know? Yeah, it says there that over ten thousand sex offenders. That's a broad category of sex offenders, like in terms of mm. different sexual acts that have been listed under the sex offenders register. Are in the UK prisons. So 10,000. From that 10,000, 88.7% are British. White British. Um, English. Fi- yes, that's right. 50% of those are Christian. Ooh. Just under 5%, just under 5% of UK sentenced sex offenders are Muslim by faith mm. in, or ascribed to the Muslim faith. So it's quite important to kind of understand that that Look the scaremongering taking place. When you, when you say Muslim, are, you, are we talking about Asians or blacks? <coughs> all or kinds. Because you get all kinds. Basically, those who ascribe to the Muslim faith. You know, so they all, not, all so the you, different ethnicities combined. So here you're talking about eighty-eight point seven percent are white British. From that eighty-eight point seven white British, or, or from the whole kind of hundred percent, you can say fifty mm. percent are Christians, of which only five are ascribing to the Muslim faith. Yeah. Of which we mix up of some Asians and so the facts know. really speak, the stats speak for themselves, really. And you can only ask, you know, it's only beggars' belief if people still think there's no Islamophobia in the media and in in government. You know, um, uh, what's the word rhetoric that's kind of narrative out there? Um, clearly, making it an Asian problem or a Pakistani problem or a Muslim problem. By the way, none of us are Pakistanis, by the way, but we are Muslims. And if it were any community who were just being targeted uh, and being um, de- Demonized and maligned in this way because of their religion, you know, I would have obj- I would stand up and object. And similarly, when this Israeli man or somebody who believed in the Israeli project, a Zionist, okay, um, or, you know, he went he he wants to join the fight against um, you know Palestine in Israel. He wants to participate in that mi- in the military action. He wants to go abroad and participate in fighting wars, okay, for Israel. Very much like how many men are fighting uh, other wars in Syria and stuff like that um, uh, you know this guy goes and beheads his maid another woman okay what country is this sorry just I, I read two different reports to be honest. I think he's Italian in some origin but there is some report that it happened in the US Okay, mm-hmm. there is a report. It's on Loon Watch. We have the um, uh, the article and reference here. But again, it's hard for me to unless I share it to uh, Mr. Producer right now. It's a bit difficult for me to uh, share the the, the clip, uh, the, the the actual source for that on Twitter. Um, I will try after the show, inshallah. But I'm not giving any uh, promises. Okay, um, so those are the those are my thoughts. Really, again. It makes front page news when a Muslim does it, but when a non-Muslim is doing it, regardless of whether he's Jewish, whether he's white or not, when somebody else does it, it doesn't seem to make the news. But it's not what? headline it, worthy. You know it's not thing. all doom and gloom. I mean, I mean, we are looking at it from a very kind of. I mean, I don't know. When I say doom and gloom, I mean, I mean, we will get an apology in like the twenty fifth or the twenty sixth page. So okay. it's not that bad. Okay, I'll I mean, see. We'll get an apology. No, bro, if you're bar. lucky, you're going to get an apology. That's only if like, there's... Nowadays, they don't bother apologizing. It, it doesn't happen. So I don't know what um, uh, century you're, you're coming from, <laughs> Mr. Pillar. They don't do that anymore. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't happen. That only happens really if the press complaints come through and then the press commission or whatever they're called kind of exert their pressure and so yep. therefore okay all right we will issue an apology okay you know so prove two me three wrong. months later when you know yeah, prove me wrong i think um i don't know if mend mend i think that's what they're called mm-hmm. mend, yes, yeah. go to their website um I, I don't work for them i don't know you know you know they're what, formerly what known as i engage yeah yeah formerly known as i engage go to their website mend they have some instructions and um you know how uh, they give you some information as to how you can exercise your rights as you know uh, the members of the public who who read papers and stuff like that check it out and um sorry you want to go for a break? Mr. Mr. Let's go for a break. Yeah, yeah. After this one, we go straight to the break. So yeah, check out their website, men. They'll give you some help on how you can, if you want to complain, that what steps you want to take on complaining and what what more to do really about um, uh, you know this kind of Islamophobic agenda in the media. So by all means, go check out their website, uh, Mr. Producer. We're going for a very short break right now. Middle Path Radio, your number one online. Islamic Talk Station. Via Ihsasuna Arah, 
زاده انت حنان فيا ابتغي حضنا يتيم قاهر الروح نقيا فيا احساس اراه زاده انت حنان فيا ابتغي حضنا يتيم طاهر الروح نقيا كي يحيل ظلمة القلب بإحساسه ضيا كي أرى غابات أيامي بأضلاعه فيا كي يروي خافقي من طهر أعماقه ريا حضن أطفال اليتامى يترك الوجدان حيا يملأ القلب حنانا دافقا دفءا نديا بين أرواح اليتامى يسكن الحب نقيا قد حباهم ربنا نبضا بريئا نشعر الإحساس فيهم صافيا عذبا زكيا ضمني طفلي منيا ضمني أكثر هيا Download our app MP Radio from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Follow and like us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus. تاريخ تلقوا فيه إثباتا جليا كم عظيم رغم يتم كان بالمجد حفيا كابن حنبل وابن باز عانق الأفقى عليا والذي يسعى بنا كي نبلغ الجنة يا رسول الله أحمد غير أيتام البرية عاش يتمن في صبا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله You're back uh, We're back and you're listening to the security council i have to uh, you know watch myself when i call it uh, cafe ikhwan by accident so welcome back um this is middle path radio and you're listening to the security council um when it calls and texts coming in we are talking about some of the most controversial subjects out there that a lot of radio stations are not willing to even uh, you know discuss on air okay and uh, we we are pushing the boundaries here alhamdulillah um because those are genuine issues those are real issues those are things that when we go out there in the community and we are speaking to you know regular people um ordinary folk and these are the views and these are the thoughts that we're hearing and and a lot of the time i hear brother khabab that there's nobody out there giving this narrative you know nobody's saying what their people are thinking you see well here we are giving that narrative that's exactly what the council the, is all the about the people's voice as they say you know so that new branding I think, I, I think that's a new, uh, yeah, the security council the people's voice the people's you know. voice that's right but um, it's, I'm a bit disappointed nobody's calling in you know these are some very very juicy topics that we are discussing absolutely and um, we would like you to come and dissect it for us and join in and have a piece of the cake you know do call us on zero seven four double seven eight zero zero eight zero so zero eight zero two four eight that's zero seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight and follow us on twitter that's at middle path radio alternatively check out our facebook page or drop us an email on info at middle path radio dot com now I know we talked about different things and we haven't got an opportunity to talk about all the agendas that we mentioned out here, but we will say how... Let's talk about this uh, Iran-US uh, love affair that's going on. Uh, the reason why I say secret love affair is because people 
surprise, surprise. People will have you believe that Iran and the United States are like, you know, what's the word, you know, sworn enemies. Okay, from two polar opposite in kind of so parts just of like the world. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Yep. People will have you believe that Iran hates the guts of the U.S. and the U.S. would love to, you know, wipe out Iran the way they and did Iraq. The brink of war with each other. And yep. Bit, you know, I just wanted to kind of show you how mm, you might not want to believe that, you know, much. So there's a BBC article. You know, you guys complain that we always go to the Guardian for this kind of article and it can become a little bit, you know, one-sided. So here's a BBC so article. Let's go to the biased uh, yeah, broadcasting service. Let's go to the other service. end. <laughs> <laughs> biased broadcasting service. What it says, the title is Iran backs US military contacts, yeah, to tackle the Islamic State. Sorry, is that right? To fight. Excuse me, I was being a bit, a bit soft there. Iran backs US military contacts to fight ISIS. It says here Islamic State, but I want to avoid using that. Um, they want to fight ISIS. So, here it is. Iran's supreme leader has approved cooperation with the US as part of the fight against ISIS in Iraq. Sources have told the BBC Persian uh, part of their uh, you know, uh, media wing. So Ayatollah Khamenei has authorized his top commander to coordinate military operations with the US, Iraqi and Kurdish forces. Sources in Tehran say Iran has traditionally opposed US involvement in Iraq, an Iranian ally. Really? Why would Iran oppose uh, US involvement in Iraq, an Iranian ally? Really? Mm -hmm. You're telling me Saddam and Ayatollahs of Iran were best friends, Sunnis and Shias? That's nonsense. I'll tell you why they're an ally right now is because the US uh, invaded that country, in, uh, invaded Iraq, and they installed an Iranian approved Shia government, just like they have in Iran, a Shia government, right? That now, that those two governments are allies yes but not when the u.s invaded iraq this was to the glee and uh, delight of the iranians that uh, the u.s were coming and the u.s sorry the iranians and the shia were the primary ally uh, to the u.s when they uh, did their uh, invasion of iraq based on a pack of lies so again Take everything uh, they, they're saying with a pinch of salt. However, Iran's foreign ministry official denied it would cooperate with the U.S. against ISIS. So they're playing the, yeah, uh, we are supporting U.S. And then, no, we're not. They're denying it. So, Tehran had been critical of the way Washington launched airstrikes on IS only after U.S. interests came under threat, she said. A further indication that Iran may have approved cooperation with the U.S. comes from CNN's Christian Amanpour. Did I say her name right? Yeah, she's a very well-known um, news anchor, I think, a um, mm -hmm. host anyway for CNN, who tweeted that Iraqi President Fouad Masoum uh, had told her as much on Thursday. Uh, is is Amanpour Iranian? Is she Persian at all? Uh, I don't know. Could be, could be South Asian, she possibly. She could be Lebanese, even. Shia, I'm not sure. Anyway, Shia Iran sees the extremist Sunni IS group, which views Shias as heretics, as a serious threat. So last month... U.S. airstrikes helped Iranian-backed Shia militia. Let's just finish it there. I think you've heard enough uh, about how there is this lovely cooperation, lovely network. So, not, so the Iranians ain't the monsters suddenly, all of a sudden. These guys are the allies. These guys are the good guys. We back them. We support them. We give them the money. We fund them. And we arm them as well. We provide them the intelligence. And we go fight their fights for them. Because the Sunnis obviously are uh, political um, enemies of, of the Shia. So now the Americans are fighting the fight for the Iranians. So what was all this rhetoric, you know, just a, just a year or two ago about the access of evil and the so-called, you know, what is it? The nuclear weapons program. And, and even the rhetoric on the other side, which is that the U.S. are the devil. And, uh, <laughs> Death and, to USA, you know, all that <laughs> ranting going on. It's all a, all a fix. The whole thing's a farce. So I think people need to be a little bit more. Go on, Mr. Producer, I thought you had something to say. No, 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 no. I was just um, just reading some of the tweets and all that stuff. Uh, just the normal boring stuff. Okay, sure. Feel, feel free to share some of your boring tweets uh, that you were referring to over there. No, we don't mind at all. So that's the that's a quick story. There are so many other reports coming out of there. Say, for example, on a slightly different uh, perspective here, um, there's um, uh, the Israeli and Iranian um, uh, U.S. 
love triangle if you want to mm. call it that way yeah because we heard recently so should i say iran should i just say shia maybe in a more general term okay um we heard i think there's an article in the telegraph i have it here in my in my um archive of of articles um uh, i believe it was in the telegraph where there's uh, you know statements from uh, former or current head of mossad um the intelligence agency the equivalent of MI6 MI5 of the or CIA entity. yeah of the Israeli Zionist um uh, government so Mossad's um leader or former uh, leader actually openly declared that um Assad was Israel's man in Syria Assad is their ally Assad is of course a Shia okay and um he is we know the butcher and a dictator who's been massacring i think what is it 200,000 um uh, civilians the to last, date the last uh, recorded stats from the united nations was 191,000 but well, that's recorded as of well, uh, many obviously uh, 191,000 i got know, the number wrong that. okay so it's still roughly 200,000 so this guy okay has been doing these things and let's be clear right the guy is not killing shiites he's killing only sunnis so all this talk about um you know Yazidis in in Iraq and all this talk about ethnic cleansing and minority groups being you know wiped out how come none of this rhetoric was happening when um you had the Sunni the, the Sunnis being wiped out and ethnically cleansed by Assad and it's happening right it's still happening and and it's no surprise to me that Israel's come out not just any ordinary Israeli but somebody high up in the intelligence echelons saying very categorically that Assad is Israel's man in the Middle East he's the guy who was protecting <laughs> Israel's interests Mr producer protecting the borders i was just going to say this is i'm going to use a i'm going to use a very bengali term here but they are getting them themselves in a right hotkey here yeah literally i mean you know this is like eastenders on an international scale here that's it this is this is one of those uh, love triangles like i said the us uh, israel and iran they they are all in it together they're all bedfellows um iran let's not just say iran the um not all shia let's be fair okay because there must be many good um shia out there we call like, it the middle east and this yeah we're talking about the shia regimes like that in that of iran and uh, uh assad okay let's be fair you know the shia regimes of assad and iran and we find those two regimes cooperating collaborating even militarily um hezbollah forces okay are in syria uh killing civilians very well documented all the non muslim all the mainstream outlets have reported this the hezbollah the shia group okay from iran okay but also from uh Leban- based in lebanon they are in uh syria right now committing a lot of these atrocities doing it on behalf of assad who is their shia uh, brother so you have Syrian. hezbollah you have the iranian revolutionary guards and then you have the syrian army fighting assad all alongside with one and, and what does israel <laughs> say oh well we um you know assad is our guy in the middle east he's protecting our interests okay now you tell me if the the shia were ever any problem f- to the americans or to to the israelis we have uh, just now we read the article to you how iran is cooperating and sharing intelligence and working together with the united Point states be- uh, against uh, you know um uh, you know their project in 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 in, in, in iraq right the, now the thing me look, look look iran if it had such enmity towards the um, the the um, america um then over the last 10 years or a bit more than that um Iran borders two countries which the US have invaded yet they did not raise a finger in opposition so they had enough capability and uh, the situation was there for them to intervene yep. and to actually get their hands dirty and finally have that great fight we've been all talking about it's like you know all this banter between you know build up to the boxing match but that boxing match never comes you know and Afghanistan in was fact, invaded and to be best best mates <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, so Afghanistan was invaded and uh, silence, you know. Oh, you know, I don't know what's happening over there. And then uh, yeah. Iraq is invaded. So, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> we actually might like that happening. You, know, you guys come along, you know. And, and the so-called down. wiped Israel off the, um, you know, map and stuff like that. And then there's all these 2,000 civilians being killed. And again, oh, well, well we know, we're kind of busy right now to bo- be, be bothered about Palestinians. 
Yeah, yeah we're so anti-Israel. It's nonsense. You know, Muslims need to wake up and like, don't believe this political rhetoric. They, they know that when they talk like this, a lot of ordinary Muslims, a lot of naive people will start actually thinking about these guys are saying what we want them to say. They're finally, you know, telling the Israelis, you know, how it ought to be. And, uh, I'm and glad. Then, I'm and glad. They start, start supporting, uh, you know, yeah, Iran and, and they start supporting Ahmadinejad and start thinking highly of Hezbollah and stuff. Look, you guys need to see the facts for what it is. These guys are in the pockets of the United States and in the pockets of uh, of, of Israel. I'm glad, Brother Ahmed, you have finally seen the light um, moving away from uh, your friends. And uh, I've always uh, been uh, clear about... Um, uh, <laughs> I've always been clear about Assad, Hezbollah, and um, Iranian um, you know, meddling and their project against the Sunnis. I think the, 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 the rest of the community always point their finger at Wahhabism in inverted commas and their you know kind of uh, effort to malign the Shia and the literature that is coming out there yet we yet what's really happening on the ground in in reality is that is the Shia doing all the killing of, of Sunnis there was no revolutionary groups there were no rebel groups in Syria I've been to Syria before the revolution there was not people were not militarized there they were ordinary people they were ordinary people and in fact a lot of people from the from the UK would have you know, been quite surprised that this is actually part of the Middle East because it is very much like the UK. Well, it was very much like the UK. Very when, much modernized, very much westernized, very exactly. much no Islamic uh, identity whatsoever. At all. So all of this Barring actually happened uh, when Assad started killing those unarmed and peaceful protesters uh, when they were asking him to step down. How many years has that guy been in been in power, in office? I don't know. Him and his father together decades, combined. Decades. Just, decades and decades. It's just like you know, if the if the Western world, if if our country, you know, um, pretend to care about um, uh, you know democracy and uh, the, the 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 choice of the people, these are the kind of kind of countries that they have been supporting, okay, in suppressing the people, in oppressing the people, in then torturing the people, imprisoning the people, those who wanted a different political. Um, solution. But as good old Tony Blair would say, you know, the Middle East is not ready for democracy. That's so right. they still need their dictators there to, you know, keep the pe- keep the savages at bay, as they would say. So to me, it comes to me as no surprise, really, when they say we need to support Assad against ISIS. You know, uh, tell me something new, guys, because um, I'll be honest with you, that's been your policy in the Middle East for the past 50, 60 years. You know, propping up these uh, puppets and these uh, tyrants to oppress and keep the people of the uh, the population of the uh, Arab and the Muslim world down. This, this is what you've been doing all all along. Something just popped into my mind because I just obviously mentioned it, but I'm yeah, surprised it's not on the agenda. You know, Tony Blair winning his award of being philanthropist of the <laughs> of the year. What a what an <laughs> <You> insult! <know. laughs> what did they give him a uh, yeah, Nobel <laughs> Peace Prize or was that given to Obama? I think actually, that was next. I think that's next. I think that's next. Obama okay. was given a Nobel Peace Prize, but you know, can uh, you, you know, imagine Tony that Tony Blair got philanthropist Philanthropist of the year, you know. Uh, Just ex- explain to us what on earth does philanthropist mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and can you spell it without looking at a dictionary? Go on, it ask, starts with a P. Ask Google. But, but right. philanthropist okay, used to be, uh, from what I recall of my uh, I memory, that? which mm. is uh, somebody, you know, a person who's very much uh, generous, a charity, you know, one who gives lots of charity, one who is, you know, helping others and so forth. That tends to be, um, from what I remember. Or now, let's do a quick check. Who's got an iPhone here? <laughs> You don't have nah. an iPhone here. Okay, so we can't compare. But let's see if uh, this kind of voice activation business actually works. Let's hear it, let's hear it. Okay, Google. Define philanthropist. Oh, it failed. What a shame. Well, I'm, just so, in the, I'm just in the standard kind of check here, which basically means uh, what a philanthropy flop. means love of humanity. Uh, what? <laughs> philanthropy means love, love of humanity. humanity. In the sense of caring, nourishing, developing, enhancing what it is to be human. What does, a shame. Does he say yeah. anywhere go to war as well? Well, maybe it was. On a pack of lies. <laughs> on a pack of lies. <laughs> so uh, here you go. That's basically what it is. And a philanthropist is somebody who engages in. Killing Iraqis. In philanthropy. <laughs> and Ar- that Ar- is Ar- someone who donates his or her time, money, and or reputation to charitable causes. Such as the war in Iraq. So, of course, here, yeah, I think the charitable cause here must have been the Tony Blair Fund, um, you know, the retirement fund, which and obviously... The, how many has it got? You know, uh, how many million pound has You know, it, it's just amazing, you know, this guy. I think all the papers were up in arms in terms of, you say, how, ridiculous. How can you call Tony Blair a philanthropist? 
well, you know, just shows, you know, he's far system. from charitable. This is what Russell Brand The man who charges like, hundreds at, of thousands of pounds just to system. talk. Exactly. Look at this system. I mean, it kind of rewards these kinds of people who a lot of people would love to see being tried in a war criminal, uh, war uh, cr- crim- a crimes court. What is he calling it? Uh, war criminal. War, as a war criminal, yeah, in a, in a criminal court, right? So it's very strange that he is getting it. And it's, it's, it just shows you that the system, you know, people have so much faith in these kind of awards and people think that these um, people are genuine um, leaders. You've got the article up, I see. <laughs> you, could, you should be taking this role. What are you going to read? Go on. <laughs> well, here it's just obviously it's an article from Independent referring to uh, Tony it, Blair, Philanthropist it, of the Year Award, de- uh, defended by GQ, who obviously was the one who awarded it. But he is obviously says here, GQ is far from displeased by the backlash received after the magazine questionably named Tony Blair Philanthropist of the Year earlier this week. And just in my own kind of notes, I think really mm. GQ did this as a publicity stunt more so for them and to bring further attention to themselves mm. uh, by giving it to such a you know war criminal. I feel like last you know, and so GQ, uh, and it says here. Uh, Richard Dugson, who organised the GQ Men of the Year Awards, said a little controversy is no bad thing. So here you go. That says it from <laughs> from right from the dog. Where is it? Horse's mouth. Sorry, not dog. Wrong one. Um, you know, he's mentioning it here that you know a little bit of controversy isn't a bad thing. You know, we like oh. to have celebrities at our event who cause a bit of a stir. He told the BBC Five Live. Mm. So having Tony was fantastic. <laughs> we like to have people who have mm. opinions <laughs> and gosh. are forthright. So, you know, he is... Talk about <laughs> bending over backwards. You know, it, Some of these guys amazing. are unashamed and brazen in their, you know, kind of uh, the, the folly and the joke that they make these kinds of awards. They should be, uh, you know, given to people who've really been working hard. You know, when you thought about, you know, people who, who stood for peace... In, but it's a charitable time, people who you, donate their time, who donate their money. You, this guy isn't donating anything. He's just, he's just you know, look, taking I'm, I'm as much Muslim. as money. Let me give some non-Muslim names. You'd think of... Uh, people like Gandhi, you'd think of people Mandela like uh, Mandela, you'd think of maybe even Mother Teresa. Indeed, yeah. And, sure. and that's why non-Muslims are up in arms about this, because they think Tony Blair, that war criminal, that war sorry, I shouldn't should say criminal, he's not been convicted yet. Um, uh, well, yeah, you're still, still a criminal without being convicted. No? I suppose you can. So that guy, I mean, getting this award, it's just, it's just embarrassing. And same with Obama getting, what is it, the Nobel the Peace Nobel Prize? The Nobel Peace Prize. How can that guy get the you know, Nobel I've, Peace I've, Prize? I've got this really good idea. Okay, and I think we need to counter this somehow. All these um, so-called peace activists and getting awards and all that kind of stuff. I think we need to kind of balance the equation here. And I think one suggestion I... I mean, if I have an input into the Cafe Juan or this... Uh, uh, most me. certainly. <coughs> most certainly yeah, there, there is no input to Juan here. I think my input would be... I think why don't we have something where we have something called like in the doghouse or something where <laughs> once a week we mention somebody who deserves to go in the doghouse. Um, the dog I mean, of the week. We can't really call no, it a doghouse. Shame. Really the shame hall of shame. Because, yeah, the hall of shame kind of thing. I mean... I mean, there's a word we can use, Django, I mean, in, in the Django <laughs> house or something like that. <laughs> the Django of the week. The Django of the week. And Django of the week, week sounds I quite good, I think. I think yeah. Django of the week. And what we do, at the end of the night, we pick our Django of the week according to our agendas. And, and I think we, even we, can even, we can even have, uh, what do you call it, uh, our, our, listeners our listeners to text and nominate. vote in. Uh-huh. Uh, and we have a list of Django of the week, and we see who has, a, uh, you know, who has the most votes, and he'll go into the uh, Hall of Shame. So I like I think, the idea. I, think, I like that. I mean, my, my recommendation. I think because it's the first Django of the week. Um, <laughs> it's uh, got to be Tony. Totally. You, you've already introduced I think, it. I see. Yeah, I think, you weren't really I think, just uh, asking I think, I think us about your one, thoughts. I think what we should do is, um, why don't we choose for the first show who the Django of the week should? Who be? Who do you think should and be the Django of the week? My first recommendation should be the Blair. Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair himself. Well, we've got. I don't think. Uh, we've got Mr. Bush. Yeah, 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 Bush would be exactly would be very happy about that. You know, he'd be yeah, thinking. Bush would be thinking. What, you know, what has Blair done? Bush. You know, I'm the one who invaded the country. He's I'm already the one who meowing. Declared the he's, war. He's scratching at the door. We've had to uh, put the mascot outside of the studio because uh, he's getting a little bit excited. You know, talk about love affairs, you know, Bush and Blair. Uh, that was a that was a very you know. That's where the scratching was coming from. That's right. So. Yeah, I mean, what do you guys think? If this is a good idea, the Django of the Week idea, you know, you guys should be letting us know. Text us or call us on 07477-080248. That's 07477-080248. I know you guys are listening because we've got stats here of who's listening. And we who's know not. who okay? you are. But you need to be, like, contributing to the show, okay? Um, we keep it sensible and lighthearted, no problem, but to within limits. No, uh, we are, We're very happy to have your contribution on. What we can do is uh, maybe even... Uh, Sometime during the week, draw up a list of Django's of the week um, uh, for nomination. 
mm-hmm. and then through the week we can have the votes coming in and then the line closes on maybe you know the voting line closes on the show well and we talked about a few individuals so. uh, well, I'm not sure if people will be happy if we add them on the list of nominees but well, obviously Khamenei. they don't get no, yeah, Ayatollah Khomeini is one of them we talked about somebody else as well <laughs> in the beginning of the show <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people might can not I, be happy about that can I, but can I, I think you just can I re- what, what, retract my proposal then <laughs> yeah <laughs> you may just backfire you on you Mr. Yeah, Producer you well th- it's not a problem as long as they don't get nominated so then they're not Django of the week no, isn't no, it? No. it could be a, no. a sense no, of they will be nominated but whether they win is the question no, here, we, you know. we, we add whoever has been talked about on the show on the list. That's just how it works. So if you talk, if he's a story, and so whoever the biggest Django is of the week, you know, yeah, whoever Django holds the headline, whoever has done the b- biggest then. deed. Just name, uh, le- just leave it as Mr. Blair as Django of the week. Okay, he is and the crown, the I was, prince. I, I, you know. I, was gonna, I was gonna add Ayatollah Khomeini in there, Khomeini, but uh, but I think you know, I, mean, I, I think that GQ wants to come. I think there's gonna be more to come with this new love affair. I think there's gonna be more more to come. New headlines coming up very soon as well. Was these these love a couple love of weeks ago? A couple of weeks ago, we could have put um, what's his name, Boris uh, yeah. the Hair Johnson. Uh, on, on, you know, no, even you know, Mr. Jim, Jim well, Jimbo as well. You know, you know, Jimbo, Mr. Fitz, Mr. Fitz, indeed. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, Wait, you know, I'm on the, this this jungle of the week is it's going to be a hit. You know, that I, got I hope so. Inshallah, I hope so. Let's get some more contribution from our listeners uh, through your texts and your calls. It's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. That's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. We're coming up to the end of the show. One of the topics that we wanted to talk about was terrorism. Are you afraid terror, yet? Terror, terror, Are you living terror. in paranoia? Are you cowering under your bed and your white bed sheets? It all depends. Do you sleep with the lights on? It all depends what the government says. It all depends. On I do remember you know, this whole thing about terrorism and uh, this whole fear mongering. But there was a very good, um, I would say, a BBC documentary, a three part series that wasn't that too, not too long ago, uh, called The Power of Nightmares. I don't know if you recall watching yes, that. Yes, I did watch and that. And it was very much linked to uh, the whole Cold War thing and talking about the whole concept of, uh, you know, the, the neoconservatism and, uh, you know, how the you know they both need each other in terms of <laughs> indeed <laughs> you know and I think that's something that maybe we could possibly even share it's, it's the excellent if we can find point it. actually that you raised because that very much um, fits in line with what we're talking about just now about terrorism are you afraid because this is as you said what is it the power of nightmares power of nightmares we yeah. call this the uh, you know the, the the politics of fear because if you can make your the population become so afraid so paranoid of a perceived threat then that population is ready to accept any kind of change, any kind of new law, any kind of uh, in uh, you know privacy invasion, any kind of curtailing Just of their civil, li- civil liberties, because their own personal safety uh, trumps all of these other liberties, and that's how. So literally, it's basically I'll give away all of my powers, all of my rights, all of my liberties freedoms. and freedoms. Just to you know, just so you can keep just me so safe, so can, you can and next safe, you know yeah. you'll end up in a state which is a uh, very no. much uh, no different to any other dictator states in the world. That's correct, and so this is how it works. So let's take. But for here example, is by consent as opposed a, to by a, force. Beautiful, and that's the, the, that's how you get away, get out of the whole dictatorship um, equation. You're no longer a dictator. Is it called the elective are dictatorship? So afraid, they said they want this power. They they want the government, and this was what was happening. I remember only a few years ago after uh, Mark Duggan was shot dead. Uh, by the police officer, we heard a lot of people, even on mainstream, you know, London uh, radio stations, calling in and saying, "What are the police doing? Why aren't they doing enough? There's so many rioting going on. We need them to crack a few skulls." Literally, these are the words. You know, crack a skull or two, and you'll see how the riots go to go go to a close. Where's the tear gas? Why aren't the horses trampling? You know, uh, these uh, these Little rioters kids. and stuff like that. You know, I was shocked. Where's the water cannons? These were the, these were the kind of language that all. Ordinary, you know, ordinary Joe civilians were, were were asking. This is what, what they were demanding from the police. And I know the police at the time were having a lot, suffering from a lot of cutbacks. They were under the cosh um, quite heavily at the time. So I, I felt that they were trying to make a point by standing back um, during the riots so that the people so would be up in arms demanding for more, um, uh, bigger budgets for the police, more powers more legislation that would allow police to do things that they're not normally allowed to do. And I think some of the um, experts and analysts that came on air at that time, That's not right. on our station, they said that the only time that they used water cannons in the UK was actually in Northern Ireland, okay, when they were having difficulties 
over there. So, you know, the UK haven't actually used these kinds of techniques. This is what is used, or you know, by Abdul Fattah Sisi in Egypt. This is what was used, this is what was used, and, and worse, of, co- of course, by other regimes. But that is how it starts. You know, in Libya, it was water cannons to begin with. But then the gunfire comes. First, the rubber bullets, and then the gunfire. You start with the tear gas and the, and the water cannons, then, and then it goes from there. It all escalates. Mr. Producer. I was going to say, you know, that's when the live, live bullets come in and... Uh, arms and legs and limbs get and then the up. argument is put forward that we were fighting terrorists and um, you know we had to do what we needed to do to protect our country we were exercising our right to self-defense to defend ourselves just like the Israelis had done and then they massacred you know civilians okay and which then they would go on to say it's regrettable we express deep dismay it was um, uh, you know uh, quite uh, what's the word I'm looking for it was abhorrent but this is the nature of war, collateral damage, we I'm afraid. We laser-guided missiles. We use the most sophisticated machinery. Yep. We dropped leaflets and sent text messages saying, get out of your house well, in five we, minutes. We, we dropped them sure. a smaller I bomb just to tell them that uh, we would dro- drop them a bigger bomb. I know this is deviating a little bit, but when you cut off all electricity, how is anyone going to charge their phone for you to send a text to read to get out of the building? Exactly. When you, when you close all the borders of that place that you're about to bomb and you've warned them to get out when you stop them from leaving or where anything going in from where are they going to go out to it's like you know closing the door of a prison cell throwing away the key and saying right here's your warning mate we're about to shoot you like a fish in a barrel and uh, you have a chance to get out if you can where, where are they going to go you just lock the, the, the door and you've thrown away the key and you're just going to shoot us like fish in a barrel People are going to die, and that's exactly what happened. You know, thousands of people died. All right. So, should you be afraid of terrorism, or are there other things that you may want to be afraid of? Let's put risk of terrorism in context. So, here's a um, uh, an article on uh, Washington's blog. Okay, um, I'm not sure if it's. I don't think it's affiliated to Washington Post at, at all. I uh, could be wrong. All right. It says here, the article says you are nine times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a terrorist. I believe this is taking statistics primarily from the United States of America. All right, you're nine times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a terrorist. It says here, let's put risk in context. Where did they get these statistics from, you may be asking. Some uh, some conspiracy theorists must have cooked this one up, right? Uh, but let's have a look. It says here, the U.S. Department of State reports, okay, let me read that again. The U.S. Department of State reports that only 17 U.S. citizens were killed worldwide mm. as a result of terrorism in 2011, okay? That figure includes deaths in Afghanistan, Iraq, and all other theaters of war. So taking the entire world, uh, you know, conflicts into a consideration only 17 US citizens were killed worldwide all right in contrast the american agency which tracks health related issues okay the us centers for disease control rounds up the most prevalent causes of death in the united states there's a massive chart here with figures i'm not going to read them i'm just going to take some of the um, emboldened text here it says here comparing the cdc numbers to terrorism death means Deaths means you are 35,079 times more likely to die from heart disease than from a terrorist attack. You are 33 times, 33,842 times more likely to die from cancer than from a terrorist attack. Keep in mind when reading this entire piece that we are consistently and substantially underst- understating understating the risk of other causes of death as compared to terrorism because we are comparing deaths from various causes within the United States against deaths from terrorism worldwide. Do you understand, guys? Yeah, so they're comparing death statistics from terrorism worldwide with just deaths in the United States, okay? If you were to consider deaths from health conditions worldwide, then the figures would be even bigger, all right? Even bigger. So I don't know why they're saying it here. That obesity is a contributing factor in 100,000 to 400,000 deaths in the United States per year. That makes obesity 5,882 times more likely to kill you than a terrorist. 
So the annual number of deaths in the US due to avoidable medical errors is as high as 100,000. Indeed, one of the world's leading medical journals, Lancet, reported in 2011. A November 2010 document from the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services uh, reported that when in hospital, one in seven beneficiaries of Medicare, the government-sponsored health care program for those aged 65 years and older, have complications from medical errors, which contribute to about 180,000 deaths of patients per year. Oh, those medical doctor terrorists. What are they doing to those pensioners? Can I quickly, can I quickly read that? A on. Facebook, um, not somebody just posted... Um, but they're basically saying that I'm not scared of terrorism being in UK, and he linked or wh- wh- whoever it is they linked a, uh, a hashtag to Oxford Dictionary's website giving the the definition of terrorism, uh-huh. quoting the unofficial or unauthorized use of violence and intimidation in the pursuit of political aims. So what they're trying to say is it's not about religion. It's about political aims, which kind of take you to an international level, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes you to an international. Governments can fall under that uh, yeah. that definition. Could be any group that could fall into that definition. Um, so I think that's a very uh, sensible thing that that yeah, Oxford uh, Dictionary. brother or sister has done, quoting from their own sources uh, in, as to what is definition and the definition for uh, terrorism. So I'm just going to quickly read a couple more uh, stats here. So those were just Medicare beneficiaries, not the entire American public. Scientific American noted in 2009, preventable medical mistakes and infections are responsible for about 200,000 deaths in the U.S. each year, according to an investigation by the Hearst Media Corporation. Okay, and it keeps going. The numbers are just like mind-boggling. A new study in the current issue of the Journal of Patient Safety says the numbers may be up to 440,000 each year. But let's use lower Use the lower 100,000 finger. That still means that you are 5,882 times more likely to die from medical error than terrorism. I think the so point is like very clear, guys. So it looks like here that right? maybe the doctor is going to go... There's more chance of you being killed by your doctor than there is to <laughs> by, by a terrorist. <laughs> yeah. So we need to wrap it up. And, you know, we, we've kind of really um, uh, covered all our points today. Um, it says here, as CNN reporter Farid Zakaria wrote last year, since 911. Foreign-inspired terrorism has claimed about two dozen lives in the United States. Meanwhile, more than 100,000 have been killed in gun homicides and more than 400,000 in motor vehicle accidents. All right, President Obama agreed. And I can keep going. There are so many high-income countries such as the UK and US could see a 6.4% surge in deaths from heart disease, while low-income countries could experience a 26% rise in mortality I think rates. if you keep going and going, it's going to be endless. You know, I think I'm think i literally yeah. scrolling, scrolling, and there are so many facts and stats here. I am so shocked. I am shocked. Um, you know, so be afraid. People should really... Um, should really um, familiarize themselves with these kinds of stats because the powers that be today will have you believe that it is terrorism that they need to be afraid of, that it is terrorism that is, you know, um, uh, waiting for them around the corner, that it is terrorism that is, um, you know, imminent, uh, that it is terrorism that they need to save their children from, that it is terrorism that they need to protect the country from, when in reality, the actual deaths caused by terrorism is a very small number. I'm not suggesting that deaths are insignificant if it's only a few or a handful, but it's about putting things in perspective, putting things in their correct context and in proportion to the other statistics out there. Brother Khabab, are there any final words from your good self before we close tonight's show? There's not really much to add on to that. I think that last kind of uh, discussion point that kind of sums it sums it all up. You know, the scaremongering, the fearmongering. I think that's the underlying or underpinning issue with all the kind of stories that we've been kind of, or the headlines we've been discussing over the last few weeks on the show. You know, the underpinning thing goes back to this whole thing of scaremongering people and the perceived threat of terrorism and extremism um, being the kind of the engine that's driving, you know, all of this political agenda that we've been discussing. That's right. You're absolutely right. That gives the governments the um, legitimacy. Their legitimacy. It gives them their, how do you pronounce that word? Raison d'etre? D'etre? It basically that's their purpose to exist 
Otherwise, they don't have a role, you know, they don't have a reason to do what they're doing. But this is how they justify, this is how they present the basis for doing what they're doing. Their wars abroad, their wars here and there, you know, stealing the oil and all of that stuff that they're doing. They have to be able to present a viable, believable excuse as to why they're doing that. And terrorism is just that perfect excuse. Okay, we were going to talk about other issues tonight. But I'm afraid we cannot do that. We were going to talk about the revelation that um, uh, they were going to release um, uh, some of these pictures, 2,000 of these horrific pictures of torture that the uh, U.S. authorities were involved or responsible for. Okay. And I I was really going to go into that one, um, but we can't do that. Maybe we will talk about it in a a forthcoming week, especially when the pictures break. Hopefully, um, uh, we'll be able to discuss that. Okay, and what I was going to say was um, Vice News did a, did a piece and they said, do you think these kind of pictures being released into the public would actually increase terrorist attacks? And, you know, that's a very logical question and I think it's a fair question that what I, it, it kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It helps us to understand that these kind of things are what causes anger and hatred, you know, in in parts of the world, these kind of revelations, these kind to of policy, pictures, isn't it? Yeah, if you're policy. doing these kind of things to people, there are going to be a lot of people angry to see um, those kind, of ho- ho- horrified to see that they'll be very very angered to to know that you are doing this in Iraq, you are doing this in Afghanistan. So naturally, those people in Afghanistan and Iraq are going to start developing a hate for you. I'm not going to say what's legal, what's illegal. That's not for me to discuss today. But I want you to just understand that why is it that people do. What they do, even the mad person, I you have to understand uh, why a mad just, person. Just just the last point I want to mention here. I think there, there was a, a statement uh, from a Yemeni father who I think lost his child during one of the drone attacks that took place. Is mentioning that how uh, you don't need no, you know, the moment you've killed, you know, or taken away my child or you know a person's child, you know, you don't need no Al Qaeda to be basically uh, seeking out, re- you know, seeking out revenge here. You know, it's it's, it's 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 almost it's a natural issue. Naturally want to Obviously, do, so here know, the, the enmity revenge. and the hatred that we build is is natural. You come and you kill my child, no matter what happens. You know, you know yeah. it doesn't matter who I am or what political alignment I have or yeah. anything like that or what well, views how much I hold. You don't like Al Qaeda, you, know, you will still you know, want to exactly, get some so, justice for you. For and you can't just you can't just paint this brush as Al Qaeda. Obviously, now today they're the the, the biggest foe being um, uh, ISIS. You know, yeah. you can't just paint it. You know, oh, they all must be it ISIS. It just happened out know. of the blue. They just suddenly went crazy. All of we just don't know what happened. You know. Why we don't know? Come on, get get off it. You know, people know why these guys are doing what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, and I should be able to say that without having to go into the question of whether it is good or or bad what what they're doing. What we're talking about is why is it that they may be doing what they're mm-hmm. doing? Because I think the other question is quite clear. All right, and we're not going to entertain that. And you mentioned this story about the Yemeni uh, father who said that. But more recently, in the Gaza bombing, just happened only a couple of weeks or three weeks ago. When that happened. Um, we heard of a father that I think it, again it was the Vice News and it reported how um, when he when this father had lost all his his wife his his uh, daughters his sons all of them had died he was on his own he was a, he, he had no family after this bombing and the reporter said that he just slumped down on the ground and hid his face in his hands moments later after a moment of silence he stood up and he said. I swear by God that I'm going to marry four times and I'm going to have 10 children to each of these wives of mine and I will donate all of them to the resistance uh, to fight uh, Israel. That's the kind of stuff. He's probably got nothing to do with Hamas. He's got nothing to do with Islamic Jihad. He probably doesn't know anything about any of these groups. He's an ordinary father who's lost his wife, his kids. How emo- how torn he must be feeling inside, you know, and his home is destroyed. He's sitting on the rubble thinking I've lost everything. But look how motivated he suddenly became in resisting the Israeli occupation and how vocal he suddenly became I, I don't I didn't see any Hamas uh, recruiter in a balaclava come in there and saying you know come on come and join me brother and we can you can we can get justice for you none of that happened it was just there right there then and there in front of these non-muslim reporters and they were and this was the man's response so it's perfectly natural when people lose their families like this that they feel immense and intense anger and you have to only ask yourself what would you do if it was your children what would you do if right now the very roof above our head was being blown to smithereens. You know, we have to ask ourselves the these same questions. thing. Even how when uh, Sherry Blair, the wife of Tony Blair, when she was visiting uh, Palestine, 
and then eventually she saw some stories and also saw you know met with people and eventually she said although i don't condone it i can understand why people go out wow. and do you know uh, uh, su- suicide uh, operations mm. i can understand why we call them body body, fe- body vest bombings you because know, that's so, just some um, um, political um, i'm using the term that uh, no, she was commonly using, used yeah? Yeah, yeah but you know uh, you know uh, she can understand although she doesn't condone it she can understand suicide what re- what drives a person to actually go to the point where they've got nothing left to live for you know this is what she's coming from her perspective that's how she understood it yeah, yeah. they've got no other weapons to defend themselves with apart from their own bodies and that's what they use you know so in in that sense you know she and then she was completely scathed and until she had to kind of be uh, apologize you know, from her own comments, you know basically. and it wasn't just her i think there were notable other people who mentioned the similar kind of things and they were very much attacked because but when you see with your own eyes the plight of these people living in such and then you put yourself in their shoes you think what would you do could you not be moved to tears you know so. it's just shocking even these so called what's his name the hard man uh, the bully guy roskem uh, yeah roskem he goes there you know the uh, middle eastern yeah i just thought like even that guy had the respect and the decency to understand what is going on why these guys are doing what they're doing for their country for their freedom you know we talk about apartheid we talk about how the aborigines were being wiped out we talked about how the the true the original americans the native americans uh, were you know systematically you know um removed from existence yet this same process is happening right before the world's eyes in palestine right now and yet nobody seems to care everything else is like a academic discussion and a history lesson yet history is unfolding before our very eyes today in the middle east and we kind of want to gloss it over and say it's okay you know it's, it's their right to self def- defense defend themselves you know uh, and uh, kill civil 2000 civilian palestinian civilians in the process you know that kind of stuff um is and just I, I, i'm us. very much surprised that she just realized now that one of the news stories was not about uh Joan Rivers. <laughs> How could you not have her as Django of the Week? Joan Rivers. Look, you know, um, he goes. What did, she, what did she say? She goes. They're dead, and they deserve to be dead. Well, she's dead now. And, and I couldn't put it better myself in terms of she must have been talking about herself there. She's dead you know? now, and that's why <laughs> she can't fit the Django of the Week because she's no longer with us. Uh, but there are some Django's who are still with us, still doing their Djangoism, um, uh, or, or, and, they need, to and be they need to be on that list. The no, I think we should do the Django of the week. I think we need to have a Django Hall of Fame. The Hall of Django's. The Hall of Django's. And know? obviously, number one at the moment, we since somehow we've the producer has muscled yeah, in, Mr. is a yeah, Mr. Mr. Tony, Tony Blair, th- the I war mongering Blair. He should be privileged. He's the first Django on our list. We have given him this prestigious award. I hope he gives us a little statement. The non philanthropist of the year <laughs> <laughs> for being war mongerer and. Hall of uh, being the top top man for the so Hall please of do Jones. I think look out on our, on our social media on our Twitter and our Facebook for the uh, for the for the list of uh, nominees for Django of the Week and do start you know putting your votes in when they do come up inshallah Jazakumullah khair to everybody uh, listening uh, today who's tuned in uh, at this late hour and from before um, you were listening to the Security Council on Middle Path Radio get our app from the apple app store or from the google play store and do follow us on twitter and like our page uh, on facebook okay and finally share the number for future reference uh, for calling and texting us it's 07477080248 so without further delay it was a lovely show jazakumullah khair and i want to thank also of course our co-host and permanent member of the security council uh, brother Khabbab for coming and joining us despite his Ebola uh, virus <laughs> that he's suffering from. Jazakallah khair, akhi. Mr. Producer, any last Rafi. words? If not, then we say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station.